Chapter 32 Will and Horace reached the foot of the wall and Horace heaved the ladder into position. There were only a few men left on the ramparts above them. Most had gone to the south wall to watch the terrifying display that Malcolm had arranged. One of the remaining defenders saw the ladder appear over the top of the battlements and hurried towards it, calling to his companions for help. Horace was mounting the first few rungs of the ladder as the defender's head appeared above him. Take care of him, he yelled to Will. He could see that the sentry had a crossbow and was leaning through one of the crenellations to bring it to bear. Horace knew he had no chance of reaching the top of the ladder before the man fired, but he had complete faith in Will. The faith was justified. Will stepped back a few paces, knocked, aimed, and loosed in one movement. Horace heard the thrum of his bow and the wicked hiss of the arrow on its way. There was a sharp cry from above, and, when he looked up again, the crossbowman was gone. More arrows split the air as Will kept up a constant barrage on the ramparts. Some he aimed to hit the stones, glancing off them in a shower of sparks. Knowing that the noise and the sight of the sparks would deter the men above from coming too close to the wall. Others he aimed just above them, so the defenders knew that if they did show their faces, they were likely to be hit. That's enough, Horace yelled as he was five rungs from the top. He didn't want one of Will's arrows spitting him as he went over the ramparts. He waited a second to be sure the ranger had heard him. Then he tensed and sprang upwards, taking the last five rungs in a violent rush. Horace knew that an attacker was most vulnerable in the seconds when he reached the top of a wall like this. Defenders would wait, concealed, until a man reached that point, knowing he would usually pause to look around and get his bearings. Then, of course, there was the matter of climbing over the wall itself. During those seconds, the attacker was off balance and vulnerable. So Horace avoided the danger. He launched himself up the last five rungs. As he reached the top, he sprang high into the air, rolling into a ball and somersaulting high over the top of the ramparts and two startled defenders who were crouched beneath the lip of the wall, waiting for him. The two men cried out in shock as the dark figure seemed to sail out of thin air above them. Horace completed the somersault in the air and landed lightly on his feet several metres from the wall. He spun to face the defenders, who were only now recovering. He cut the first man down with ease. As the second came at him, he deflected his halberd thrust, seized his collar, and propelled him over the inner edge of the walkway. The man's startled cry cut off abruptly with a heavy thud as he hit the flagstones of the courtyard. More defenders were moving at Horace now, coming from the north wall. The door of the southwest tower banged open and he saw men running from there as well. The defenders from the north wall were closer, and he turned to face them. I need you here, he yelled to Will. The ranger was already on his way. As soon as he saw Horace launch himself up and over the ramparts, he slung his bow and raced up the shaking ladder after him. He reached the top and saw Horace engaging the men from the northwest tower. He needed no help, but there were others coming from the opposite direction. Will sprang onto the top of the battlements, unslinging his bow. In a matter of seconds, his first arrow was on its way, and the soldier leading the charge from the southwest tower went down. Then another behind him fell silently, and a third staggered screaming as an arrow appeared in his thigh. Three men dead or wounded within a matter of seconds. 
those following them suddenly lost their enthusiasm for the battle. Perhaps the strange monsters in the sky might be preferable to this deadly rain of arrows. The attackers faded back to the southwest tower. As the door slammed behind them, they heard two arrows thud into the hard wood. Will had time now to glance back towards the forest. The Scandians were almost at the wall. They were in three groups, carrying another three ladders. One after another, the ladders crashed against the stone walls of Mackendore, and the wild sea wolves began climbing up, screaming their battle cries. Will checked on Horace. The warrior was holding his position easily. But as he held off three attackers, another was moving in a wide arc, skirting the inner edge of the timber walkway to attack Horace from behind. Will drew and shot, almost nonchalantly, and the man yelled in pain and fell to the flagstones below. The first of the Scandians was on the wall now. Will looked and saw it was Nils Ropehander. He wasn't surprised. The man had become Horace's shadow. Help the general, Will said, pointing. Nils nodded and rushed to support Horace, his battle axe already whirring in a giant arc. The soldiers engaged with Horace, already hard pressed, were horrified by the sight of the huge, yelling Scandian charging at them, grotesque in his fur vest and massively horned helmet. They began to back away, trying to force their way through the men behind them. Nils hit them like a one-man battering ram, scattering them in all directions. Their cautious backpedalling became a panicked rush to get back to the shelter of the northwest tower. Will was directing traffic, sending a few more men to reinforce Horace and Nils, then setting up a defensive screen to engage the men from the southwest tower whenever they decided to renew their attack. Satisfied that they had a secure foothold on the west wall, Will now cast around anxiously for Karen or Buttle. They were the two danger men. The majority of the garrison were tavern sweepings and bully boys. They'd fold like parchment before the seasoned, battle-hardened Scandians. The presence of either of the two leaders might stiffen their resistance, however, and Will knew it was vital to find them quickly and deal with them. But he could see no sign of them. A cry of pain from the foot of the wall distracted him. There were three Scandians grouped round the bottom of the third ladder. One of them was sinking to the ground, a crossbow bolt in his chest. As Will looked, another bolt skated off the wall above them, striking sparks as the iron head skipped along the stone of the wall. To hit the wall, the bolt could only have been fired from the top of the southwest tower, which jutted out past the wall itself. As he looked, he saw a head appear above the ramparts there, and a crossbow being levelled. It was now that Will's superior skill asserted itself. The crossbowman on the tower had to level the bow, aim, allow for wind and distance, and the fact that he was shooting from an elevated position, and then release. Will knocked, drew, and shot instinctively, all in a matter of a second. The crossbowman never knew what hit him. The dead Scandian was tangled in the lower rungs of the ladder. His companions hesitated, then ran to the other two ladders, as the groups jostling for position there thinned out. There may have been another crossbowman on top of the southwest tower. If there was, he took heed of his companion's fate and wisely faded away. In the southwest tower... Buttle peered through a spy hole set into the oak door. He could see the line of Scandians formed up on the ramparts, and he knew that it was vital that they be driven back now. In a few more minutes, their position would be unassailable. He had a dozen men with him, 
and he drove them towards the door now, threatening, cursing, hitting with the flat of his sword. If they get any further, we're all dead men, he yelled, and he drove his reluctant warriors out onto the ramparts ahead of him. They charged the Scandian line with the courage of desperation. The Scandians saw them coming and smiled. Behind them, Buttle quietly closed the door and ran down the stairs to ground level. He had seen the tall warrior fighting the men from the far tower. He recognised him. They had met in the forest some weeks before, and he remembered that the young man had been arrogant and dismissive of Buttle's authority. That was a score to be settled, he thought. There was a trapdoor in the walkway just behind Horace's position, with a stairway leading up to it from the courtyard below. That was where Buttle was heading now. In the forest to the west, someone else was remembering events from the past few weeks. Some days prior to the attack, Trobar had been quietly patting Shadow when he felt the ridge of a massive scar under her soft fur. He parted the black hair gently and saw the livid sign of a recently healed wound there. He shuddered at the size of it. It was a miracle the dog had survived such an injury. He asked Will about it, and the young ranger told him the story of how he had found the dog and tended the wound. When Trobar asked who had caused the wound, Will told him it was Buttle, Karen's new lieutenant. Trobar knew Buttle. He had watched him from the forest when the dark bearded murderer had ridden through the countryside, recruiting new troops for the castle. Now, Trobar thought, Buttle would pay for the injury he had done to Shadow. The huge man was normally a gentle, peaceful soul, but the thought of his friend's agony and the savagery of the man who had caused it hardened his heart. As the sounds of the battle raged on the castle ramparts, Trobar retrieved a massive club he had fashioned from a tree branch earlier in the day and loped quietly across the open space to the now empty ladders at the foot of Mackendore's west wall. Nils led the five Scandians fighting with him in a wild charge at the wilting line of Mackendore defenders. The sudden impact of the charge finally robbed Karen's men of the will to fight, and they retreated wildly for the shelter of the northwest tower, intent only on getting its solid oak door shut between them and these wild eyed, bearded warriors. As the garrison members fell back, shoving and colliding with each other to be first through the door, Horace stepped to one side. The Scandians could manage this without him, he thought. He'd taken a slash from a dagger on the wrist of his sword hand, and he took the time now to bind it up with a clean cloth he took from an inner pocket. The cut itself wasn't serious, although it was quite painful, but it was a nuisance. The blood ran freely from it and down his hand, making his grip on the sword slippery and uncertain. He leaned the sword against the battlements and concentrated on winding the cloth tightly around the wound. Horace! He stopped what he was doing and looked up to where Will was balanced on one of the massive stones that formed the crenellations on the wall. The ranger was pointing to the inner courtyard with his bow. Horace moved a few paces from the wall for a better view, in time to see a figure slip through the door of the keep tower. It's Karen, Will continued. He's going after Alice. Horace considered the situation quickly. Will wasn't needed here any more. The situation was well under control. And he'd be the best one to go after the renegade knight. Get him, he yelled back. I'll take care of things here and come after you when I can. Will nodded and bounded down from the wall. He ran to the edge of the walkway and surveyed the four-metre drop to the courtyard. For a moment, 
Horace thought he was going to hurl himself off the walkway to the flagstones below, but Will had seen a quick way down. A few metres from him, there was a rope and pulley-driven platform that could be raised and lowered between the ramparts and the courtyard. It was built to provide weapons, crossbow bolts, rocks and vats of boiling water or oil to the defenders on the walls. Will slung his bow and leapt for the rope, wrapping his legs around it to slow his descent as he slid down to the courtyard. Horace gave his attention back to the rough bandage. Holding one end with his teeth, he tied a clumsy knot with his left hand. He inspected the result. It would do for the moment, he thought. And besides, the fighting was almost over. Almost. Horace's fighting instincts were finely tuned. Any foreign, unexplained sound was a potential threat, and he heard one now behind him. A slight grating noise, as seldom used hinges, were forced to turn against the light rust that had coated them. He turned towards the sound in time to see John Buttle emerging from a trapdoor in the walkway.